nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Good afternoon, everyone. So, Kwok gave a, a good um, a kind of separation outline of, of our talk in the sense that we, were going, we are going to be discussing both uh, the devices that, uh, that are being um, uh, funded under SRC, and that those are the resonant body transistors that we are fabricating in uh, standard CMOS. Um, and we're also going to be talking about the modeling of those devices, and of course those uh, those tie in um, uh, very closely together in terms of the use of the modeling for um, for uh, device development, as well as um, hopefully in the future looking forward at uh, system level uh, integration uh, of these devices. So we're going to be addressing both topics here. Um, let's uh, start uh, with the with the motivation for the resonant body transistors that we're working on. So the primary motivation uh, for these devices and specifically for CMOS integration of, uh, of MEMS resonators is uh, in frequency sources. So frequency sources are uh, useful in military uh, aerospace applications and consumer applications, industrial applications, research, automotive, basically everything uh, requires a frequency source. Um, now, the even you know your everything but the kitchen sink requires a frequency source except uh the kitchen sink also requires a frequency source now being hands free technology um moving on right so we we've uh, always had this question of uh whether or not to integrate uh resonators which provide the frequency reference uh for for these oscillators for these clocks uh in CMOS and in the early 2000s, we saw a big push towards CMOS integration, and people looked at um, at CMOS, uh, uh, MEMS on top of CMOS, at MEMS in CMOS, at MEMS first uh, solutions, and, and you know, solutions uh, kept cropping up. Now, the pros of this integration include, of course, size, weight, and power, uh, re uh, reduction in parasitics, which means uh, higher speed or better dynamic range, and reduced constraints on impedance matching networks. Um, however, as time progressed, we saw more and more solutions for, uh, for clocking um, that involved the two chips. Uh, so one MEMS chip and one CMOS. So you see, you know, if, for example, the uh, FBAR, the film bulk acoustic resonator, which is actually used for filters in your phone right now, um, there were solutions for CMOS integration. Um, you see on the left here uh, from 2006. But as time progressed, um, two chip solutions, example from Richard Ruby and Brian Otis in 2010 that you see in the middle here, um, and um, and uh, ultimately, uh, Richard Ruby and Avago, who sells, uh, who is a, a major um, a vendor for these F bars, uh, looked at uh, at integrating CMOS and F bars in, you know, complex packaging. Now, the reason for that is that uh, there is a major uh, hit in terms of complexity, cost, and yield to monolithic integration of MEMS with CMOS. It also means slower prototyping. So MEMS uh, requires very good control of, of film stresses that are not uh, typical to uh, CMOS processing and, uh, and requires very different uh, control of variations uh, in, in material properties as well as in lithography. And so the time scale for, for turning around a new uh, MEMS process is on the order of several years, um, as opposed to uh, CMOS, which, uh, which we get a, a new node every couple of years. And so by the time you've, you've come up with your monolithic solution, your CMOS is out of date. So it's not really amenable to rapidly changing technology. But we really want a solution that, um, that uh, combines, the, uh, combines MEMS resonators and CMOS. Well, why is that? Well, MEMS resonators have very high quality factors. Their frequency quality factor products, FQ products, are on the order of 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14. And that's critical for low noise oscillators, for very precise clocks. They also have very small footprint on the order of microns to, uh, to in the case of, of multi-gigahertz frequency resonators, we're talking about nanometer size dimensions, um, and they're amenable to wafer-level uh, fabrication and packaging, just like CMOS. 
So there's a full range of clocks that have that have, are really um, uh, on the market today. Of course, quartz crystal oscillators. Um, that is, in in a sense, MEMS. Um, these are acoustically vibrating uh, crystals. Uh, that, however, despite their very um, good precision and their ability to lock into PLLs uh, at very high frequency, uh, they're bulky off-chip components um, and uh, and uh, require special packaging um, to um, uh, to com to operate uh, with good stability. On the other end of the spectrum, we have CMOS oscillators, so LC tanks, right, um, inductor capacitor tanks. And you can get those up to a couple hundred megahertz, um, but uh, they're, and, and they're a relatively small footprint compared to quartz crystals, and you can design them in the back end um, uh, metals of the CMOS process. But their uh, frequency stability, particularly with temperature, is, uh, is kind of laughable compared to quartz, many, many orders of magnitude um, higher. So people have come up with solutions somewhere in the middle, which involve silicon acoustic resonators. Um, as you see, Desera and SciTime uh, have uh, commercial products uh, ready today. Um, however, these are still two-chip solutions. So there's a separate MEMS, uh, MEMS uh, chip, which is uh, packaged ind ind independently of the CMOS, of the ASIC, and they're wire bonded together. So what that does is limit the maximum frequency of operation of these clocks because the wire bonding and the parasitics of, of uh, connecting two chips together kill you at multi-gigahertz frequency. So our goal is to integrate uh, acoustic resonators, uh, MEMS resonators, and preferably in silicon, which has uh, very good material properties, uh, with CMOS in a seamless way. And our approach, as you see on the right here, is to integrate them at the front end of line in CMOS with no post-processing, no special packaging, using the standard, um, materi standing, standard materials and standard masks available um, from the CMOS foundry. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, that seems easy enough, right? Um, the, there are several things that have to happen in order to make this work. So the first is we need to come up with, with transduction mechanisms, ways to drive and sense acoustic vibrations in a way that, is, um, that works with CMOS. So there are several ways to do that. Um, what we have chosen is to use capacitive transduction to drive acoustic vibrations using the best capacitor that you can get uh, in CMOS, that's the gate dielectric. Uh, so we actually use solid dielectric transduction and, um, and launch stress waves inside the film uh, using uh, inside the stack using these capacitors. And Bishoy will talk about that in more detail um, in, both, uh, in both sections of, uh, of our talk. For sensing acoustic vibrations, uh, particularly at high frequencies, when we want to scale to tens of gigahertz uh, acoustic resonance, um, we have found that using active sensing, using transistors in order to directly sense acoustic vibrations uh, helps enhance uh, the sensitivity uh, at higher frequency. Vishoy will go into more detail on that um, as well. So now we're leveraging the CMOS process for excellent di um, dielectric properties, that is the gate dielectric, and high gain, high yield, high FT transistors. Uh, so we really are taking advantage not only for CMOS integration, but taking advantage for high sensitivity um, uh, uh, transducers uh, using this unique process. Another key thing is how do I actually confine acoustic vibrations in the stack? So uh, Bishoy will go into a lot more detail about this uh, in this talk, uh, but the idea is that we want to use the silicon in order to launch, to, to generate the acoustic cavity the resonant cavity. And so we need to confine uh, this structure using the materials surrounding it. That can be silicon oxide, the metal layers surrounding, uh, surrounding um, the, uh, the device um, above, uh, which are used for routing, for example. So, uh, so this grand vision then allows for the uh, integration of these, uh, of these embedded resonators in the CMOS stack side by side with their control circuits for very high speed um, uh, uh, 
and high dynamic range uh, uh, circuits. So with that motivation of the, uh, of the devices that we're working on, uh, I'll turn to Luca to uh, discuss the modeling aspect for these devices. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, Bishoy will go in much greater detail later also on a very big component of this project which involves modeling. So I would like to uh, spend a couple of words giving a um, higher level vision on modeling for this project. And so this is slide number nine, I believe, for uh, those that are following only on, uh, uh, on the phone. So the way I see it, on one side, there is a group of uh, researchers that I would call device developers that are designing and optimizing new devices. And here we find, of course, Professor Weinstein and Bishoy, but also uh, Professor Mike Watts working on silicon photonics and many others, including Joel Bowman, Jay Han, designing nanofluidic channels. And uh, on the other side uh, of the spectrum, I see other researchers that are very eager to take all of these new devices and put them together and uh, produce systems. I would call them system architects and make, for example, full transceivers, but also biomedical implanted lab on chips or body, or body area clothing networks. And here's, for example, Anta Chandrakesa in our department. The, the typical development flow for this kind of complex systems that are trying to use emerging technologies starts, of course, with the idea of uh, uh, the uh, device developer, an idea that uh, often gets uh, um, formalized and verified first, uh, putting together some physics-based equations and uh, a model that uh, can really uh, explore the functionality of the device. And as soon as this kind of functionality and idea comes out, for example, in a faculty meeting, uh, then the system people are um, already thinking about building a system out of those devices. And when they start doing that, they realize that they also need models to simulate uh, the functionality of the entire system that uses those uh, devices. So while in the first case, maybe the model needs to be something that is developed in a easily to modify environment, such as MATLAB, in the second case, you might want to be able to uh, also run the model in uh, languages that are compatible with uh, commercial simulators, for example, uh, very goal gay, and maybe have more speed in the execution. In order to enable this development uh, of models, of compact models, uh, a project has been set up, uh, funded by mainly by an NSF, but also in part by SRC, uh, the NEEDS project. We are at slide number 12, and this is uh, one of the representations, the pictorial representations of the effort. It's basically a platform uh, together with many compact models, a platform uh, that is being developed uh, uh, by the group of Professor Jajit Rochaduri at UC Berkeley, and the effort is um, uh, coordinated at Purdue by Mark Lundstrom and many other researchers in different universities from Stanford, MIT, and Berkeley are developing models, compact models, using this common platform. The focus of the NEEDS uh, project is really to uh, enable this first stage of device uh, modeling uh, physics-based to help the developer of the devices. However, we found it extremely useful um, and almost essential to also keep an eye on further stages of the development of the device. So you will see later in the presentation by Bishoy that uh, um, there might be also elements, at least initial elements for uh, pointing toward future work, toward using more um, accurate simulation of the physics starting from partial differential equation and using finite element. And this allows the verification not only of the functionality of the device, but also the performance of the device. And then if we want to enable the verification of the performance of the entire system that uses the device, including all second order effects, then tools could be used, including model order reduction that compress the big matrices from the finite element solvers. This is stage two, but there's also a stage three where finally a prototype is available and measurements are available, and therefore tools that can uh, fit to the measurement, the models, and calibrate become uh, important, if not essential, both for the 
verification of the performance of the device, but also the performance of, of the system. Having said that, and uh, reminding you again that the needs effort focuses mainly on the stage one, I'd like to, to introduce Bishoy, our co-supervised student, who is an amazing student in my opinion because he has both interest in design and fabrication of devices, but also very much in modeling. So um, uh, we're very happy to work with them. Thank you, Luca. So I will start first by uh, talking about the design and fabrication part, which is essentially supported by SRC. So as mentioned by Professor Weinstein earlier, we, we, we have many options for sensing our resonators in uh, CMOS. However, we, we first discard the piezoelectric sensing because it's not available in CMOS, although it would have been uh, uh, more efficient. So we turn out to FET sensing that we, we have proven in, in multiple locations before to, be, uh, to have better performance over just simple resistive sensing, and the way it works is that we have uh, a transistor incorporated into the, the resonant cavity, and the stress in the cavity modulates the channel mobility of this transistor, which generates a small signal uh, current that can read by uh, a readout circuit. We, ha we, we, can, we have shown previously that this technique uh, doesn't suffer from any area restrictions when we scale to multi gigahertz uh, frequencies because uh, FET, tran FET transistors usually define the feature size of the technology. They have the smallest uh, features in a technology. And also it has higher uh, or superior uh, noise performance. And finally, the output resistance from this technique is very high. So it makes it much easier to design subsequent uh, amplifier stage, which will usually be a trans impedance amplifier in this case. So before we proceed on uh, the advancement we have made for the design, I would like to uh, step a little back to the first generation CMOS RBT and understand uh, how it works, because this will help us uh, to, to see the improvement and how we address the issues in this uh, previous design. So first we can see here on the left uh, a cross section of the device. The device is simply an unreleased uh, cavity formed mostly by uh, a gate, by just uh, a CMOS gate, the regular uh, fed gate. And then we have to the right here uh, ABRs or acoustic Bragg reflectors, which are uh, alternating layers of uh, uh, gate, silicon gate, and then uh, oxide, silicon gate, and etc. And the device is actually symmetric, so we have these AVRs also on the other side, but they are not shown here in this SEM. And if we, we move to the top view below, we have the acoustic Bragg reflectors uh, on both sides, and then we have a driving capacitor on half of the cavity, and by capacitor it's just a very simple MOS cap. It's again a transistor that's biased as a MOS cap and spans the whole length of the cavity, but only extends to half its width. And on the other side, we have uh, a sensing fed that's just uh, a CMOS transistor, a regular CMOS transistor, but properly biased to, to get high sensitivity for mobility changes. And here we can see the measurement results. We have obtained 11.1 gigahertz uh, and quality factor of 30 with this design. And this is for the uh, electromechanical uh, transconductance, which means the output current we get versus the applied uh, voltage, versus applied driving voltage on this capacitor. So the challenges of, uh, of this design were basically First, as we are doing it in the front end of line of CMOS, we had very strict DRC rules. And these DRC rules restricted the placement of the acoustic Bragg reflectors to be at 3 lambda by 4 from the resonant cavity. And as a direct result, we can see here the ABRs ended up being placed far away from the cavity instead of the optimal placement, which would have been lambda by 4. And this resulted in a very small reflectivity solid angle as seen from the cavity. So we got lots of radiation losses in, in both, uh, in, in this direction as we, we have now very small aspect ratio. Also, one other thing is the device by design 
lacked vertical confinement, we didn't really have a way to confine uh, the acoustic energy in the vertical direction. So we also got more radiation losses in, on this end. And finally, we notice here the CMP field generated by IBM. It looks regular, but it's, it's really random. You can see from the SEM focus, it's not uh, in, in the same uh, plane. And the problem with this CMP field, we believe this is the reason why we, we get all these spurious modes here, as it's random and it's just um, positioned in an irregular way over the cavity. So to improve the performance, we first thought about we need to do something about vertical confinement. And the only option we have is basically the back end of line stack of CMOS. So the first thing that came to, to our minds is basically avoid this random CMP fill and replace it with something regular that we design and control and we can predict its acoustic properties. And while proceeding to do so, we started uh, studying the materials available in, in the CMOS back end of line and we will notice here uh, the acoustic impedance of these materials are listed. So we, we, can, we found that generally the back end of line materials have very high contrast in acoustic impedance. For example, if you consider silicon and tungsten, which is usually used uh, in bulk technologies like XFAB and TSMC, we can find uh, a ratio of almost uh, up to eight uh, in, in contrast. And for IBM that uses copper over carbon doped uh, silicon oxide, uh, we, we can find and a, an impedance contrast ratio of about 20. So we, we given that we, we think, okay, these materials have very good acoustic properties and we can put them to a good use. And also we notice that they, are, they have lithographically defined dimensions, which means they, they can be controlled very well and we can design them as, as we want. Also the, the uniform, uh, the vertical dimension is usually uniform as, as we can see here from this SEM. So we decided that such back end of line material would be amazing to construct 2D or 3D phononic crystals. And how we do it, basically it's uh, very simple. A phononic crystal is just uh, a periodic structure that uh, uh, has some band gap in its dispersion relation and thus can be used to confine uh, acoustic energy in, in certain locations. And so we can use them for our uh, vertical confinement that is needed here. And as, as we can see to implement such thing in CMOS, the simplest design to go for, uh, especially in IBM, was just to use a, a, a copper metal stripes over the, the low-key dielectric in the background. And by doing so, we don't really violate any DRC rules because from a technology point of view, this looks like uh, just routing metal. They are uh, meta, uh, meta routing going uh, back and forth between any circuits. So to, to make the picture clearer, uh, this structure here will be uniform in the Z direction, in the out of plane direction. So you can see it from the top as just uh, metal lines. And moving forward to design this PNC, we need to get its dispersion relation first, which we can see here is done by uh, FEM simulation over the, by scanning the K vector over the edges of the irreducible uh, Brewen zone as marked here. And uh, we can see on the right, we got a very nice band gap uh, that extends for about 3.4 gigahertz from 2.8 up to 6.2. So our complete uh, second generation CMOS integrated RBTs can be seen here. We can see the cross section in this uh, SEM. We can see here the complete um, uh, PNC that's very uniform and regular both in the vertical and horizontal direction and here we have our resonant cavity. Our resonant cavity basically consists of two MOS caps that are used for driving. We see them here on the right and on the left and one uh, MOS uh, gate or uh, MOSFET for, for sensing 
the uh, positioned in the middle of the gap. And we have also these gates here that just provides uniformity that actually completes the whole cavity structure. And again, this whole uh, structure here is uniform in the Z direction as opposed to the first generation where we had half of the cavity was used for driving and half was used for sensing. Here we preserve the uniformity in the direction normal to the cavity in the direction out of plane. And this is very useful to reduce the scattering and spurious mode as we will see later. So to, to verify the operation, we, we first tested the DC characteristics of the sensing fast to make sure it works properly. And we can see a very healthy transistor here with uh, the operating point we select for further RF characterization. We have a power dissipation of only uh, 57 microwatts. So the RF measurement performed for these devices, we, we found a resonance peak at 2.8 gigahertz and a quality factor of 252. Uh, the response uh, seen here represents uh, an eight times improvement over the first generation devices. And also we, we clearly note the suppression of spurious mode up to a very large range, up to almost uh, four or 4.5 gigahertz where we don't see the spurious modes as in the previous case. To further demonstrate the importance of uh, the uniformity in the Z direction, in, in the direction uh, uh, normal to, to the cavity, we see here a comparison uh, of the measured results of two devices that are actually identical in all the aspects. They have been fabricated side by side on the same die, very close to each other, except for the difference that one of them had contacts uh, to the MOS caps and to the MOSFETs made as long rectangular vias, as we can see here. And yes, we know that this um, violates the DRC uh, constraints, but uh, they ended up fine in fabrication. We didn't have any problem in, in testing the devices with, with these uh, vias. And on the other side, we can see a device that has the regular CMOS vias, which are just uh, little squares with all equal sizes. So we can clearly see the device with wall vias has, uh, shows a much higher Q, and he here you can see higher peak. Uh, as opposed for the device with the squares, the peak gets uh, spread out, indicating a reduced Q, and we also note um, uh, this spurious mode that arises from the non-uniform uh, uh, cavity in, in the Z direction. We didn't stop uh, here. We actually, I guess, uh, uh, some people might be thinking now, why didn't we design uh, a resonance mode around 4.5 gigahertz that's the center of our band gap? In fact, we were trying to do so, but uh, IBM has lots of proprietary information about its uh, front end of line materials. So we have lots of unknown concerning material properties and some thickness thicknesses were not disclosed to us. So we proceeded from the measurement we have and from the SEM, we could actually characterize the FEL materials by basically using FEM simulation and going back and forth between the simulation and measurement, we were able to get almost an exact fit between uh, the FEM simulation and the measurement. And thus we can say that we now have uh, a set of material properties uh, for uh, IBM front end of line that we can use for future designs uh, and to, to get um, much more better performance. Uh, finally, uh, another question that we, we might be thinking about, we have the phononic crystal only on the top of the cavity. So what about the bottom? Does this mean we will get lots of radiation uh, from, the, from the bottom? And the, quest the, quest uh, the answer is not really. Here we can see in this uh, in this slide we we have we take just a single uh, a single section of the PNC a single uh, vertical section and we assume the PNC extends all the way up to infinity and the silicon wafer extends all the way down to infinity and we um, we impose periodic boundary conditions at these edges. So here on the right, we see the dispersion relation of such a structure. You can see here the PNC uh, bands, which we have uh, already seen before with this 
band gap, and this is not a cartoon, this is a real simulation, these are the real PNC bands. And also, I am plotting here two lines, uh, which represents omega equal CK, omega equal uh, sound speed times K vector, for both shear and longitudinal mode in the bulk silicon. These lines, or above these lines, these are all the plane wave solutions that can propagate in silicon. Below these lines, it basically means that we have uh, a, K, uh, a KX component that's larger than the, the possible K component in the medium, and so we can't get any propagating uh, modes. We can only get evanescent waves in this case. So if we superimpose the PNC band structure over this uh, plane wave uh, propagation cones, we will find that we still have this uh, region, we still have this uh, kind of band gap. It doesn't extend all the way, but this partial band gap, which means that any modes that are located here, they can't propagate upward in the PNC because they are in the band gap, and they can't propagate downward in the silicon. So we end up of having a localized mode at the surface between the PNC and the silicon. And this happens whether we have uh, the barrett oxide or not. The barrett oxide is not really adding uh, too much here, so this technique can work very well in, in bulk silicon as well. And the two red lines you can see in this band gap are basically the waveguide modes, because this structure now is like uh, an infinitely long waveguide that extends in the x direction. So here we can see the waveguide mode, uh, just two modes uh, uh, confined uh, vertically. So uh, to conclude this uh, part on, on the design and fabrication, we have uh, demonstrated the second generation of unreleased CMOS RBTs with uh, a quality factor of 252 at 2.8 uh, gigahertz and this represents eight times improvement over the third generation. We were also able to characterize the front end of line materials of IBM technology, and we have demonstrated uh, the first use of phononic crystal in CMOS to confine uh, or to achieve acoustic confinement in unreleased uh, resonators. And here I will be happy to take uh, any questions, if, um, uh, if any. Okay, so we will continue with the second half. Okay, so just before leaving uh, this part, I, I want to reiterate that um, uh, this technology or this kind of unreleased uh, CMOS RBT is also possible to implement in bulk. And in fact, uh, bulk technologies like XFAB and TSMC will have uh, another advantage over uh, the IBM technology we are using here since the dielectric, the back end of line dielectric in IBM is actually very lossy uh, from acoustic point of view as opposed to the silicon dioxide available in uh, XFAB and TSMC. So, and as, as we have seen earlier, the vertical confinement doesn't really depend on the buried oxide. Uh, the only challenge we are facing towards, uh, towards introducing this in bulk is actually uh, the high feed throughs that we got through the substrate at these very high frequencies. And we are currently investigating more uh, on uh, on the design of a cavity, on the electrical uh, design of the cavity so that we, we can reduce uh, this feed through and bring it to a minimum through using maybe uh, deep and well uh, implants or uh, guard rings. We are still investigating that. So moving forward, I would like to uh, talk uh, a little bit about uh, our modeling efforts and uh, which are supported by the NSF needs program. So to, to understand how, how we build models for this device, I would like to step all the way back uh, to the very simple bar resonator because uh, this will be our basic building block in, in the whole uh, modeling efforts. And if we can come up with a model for this, uh, uh, for this bulk mode bar resonator, then uh, we can understand how to start modifying it and how to replace its components to incorporate the FET sensing and maybe also in in incorporate the, uh, the unreleased effects of the cavity. So uh, this bar resonator is just uh, a silicon bar, as we can see here, and it has two dielectrics uh, marked in yellow 
these are our transducer, our uh, capacitive transducer. Here we, we will be using uh, uh, capacitive transduction to begin with, which is uh, much simpler. And uh, the bar resonator is actually uh, anchored from its middle point. So the middle point here, x equals 0, is fixed. And we, by doing so, we only allow the odd harmonics uh, and not, not all, all odd harmonics, but the odd harmonics that just have zero displacement in the center. So we, we allow the third and uh, uh, fifth, ninth, all, all these uh, harmonics. Uh, and here you can see the displacement. This is actually the X displacement as, as apparent in this diagram. So uh, different portions of the bar will start moving left and right. We don't have uh, up or down movement here. It's just uh, compression and decompression in the bar itself. And for uh, capacitive drive, we, um, we use this uh, left capacitor. Uh, and we can see here, this is the stress generated by the left capacitor, since it's uh, uh, a compressive stress when you apply any electrical signal here. So it, it has a negative sign. The right capacitor will be used for sensing. Uh, and we will talk about that as we go along. So this are the measurement results of, of a physical implementation of this device done by Dana Weinstein back in 2009. And we noticed the third uh, and ninth harmonic, and the ninth harmonic has uh, a much higher quality uh, factor. So to proceed with the model, the first thing we will notice here is that we, we are in a situation uh, of a coupled uh, physics simulation. We need to simulate uh, coupled physics that involves electrostatics for the capacitor drive and sense. We need to simulate the mechanical vibrations, and we should also worry about heat transfer since uh, uh, these devices may be, uh, as we have seen, uh, this specific device may be released and it doesn't have uh, good heat conductivity to the surrounding, so we should worry about uh, how much it will heat up if, if uh, uh, during operation. Uh, another challenge that uh, we can face here is that there are really unlimited device shapes and structures. So uh, one can come up with uh, uh, any shape and make a resonator or uh, any drive or sense scheme. So we want to, to make models that are flexible enough so they can modify and accommodate uh, such variability. And moving forward from this point, we decided that we will do, uh, we will make a, a modular model, a model that basically consists of several modules, and each module is responsible to model a certain kind of physics. And these modules interact through two nodes, uh, a mechanical node and a thermal node. Uh, so by doing so, you can you can basically uh, extend your model easily when needed. You can add uh, maybe extra driving modules or uh, change your sensing mechanism, and you don't need to change uh, the whole model. So why I'm saying a mechanical and thermal node, why I'm using uh, uh, the terminology node, because it, it must be uh, specifically a node uh, uh, in terms of the nodal analysis. And uh, why is that? Uh, because each component, if we think about the uh, situation here and uh, we think about the drive uh, component and the mechanical structure, they are connected by a node, meaning the drive module will contribute a force, will basically, sorry, the drive module will basically contribute a force to this node. And the, the mechanical structure will also contribute uh, uh, forces, which are the restoring force and the inertial force and damping to this node. The sense module will read the displacement of this node and produce a sense signal. And it may also contribute a driving force uh, uh, based on loading effect. The same thing happens uh, for, uh, for the thermal node, where all the modules contribute power to it, and the thermal module uses uh, this part to determine the temperature of the device. And you can very easily hook up uh, um, extra thermal sources, like if, you, if your device operates next to uh, some other uh, CMOS circuits that can heat up, you can add uh, an extra uh, uh, heat sources here. Uh, so in, in doing this uh, modular uh, model and connecting it through nodes, we guarantee that, or 
not guarantee, but we it's a kind of way to have uh, a model that's simple to expand and simple uh, to modify. So uh, let me uh, dive into the, the physics. For electrostatic drive, uh, uh, how it works is basically we have voltage control. We apply voltage across a parallel plate capacitor. And starting from the co-energy, we find that this will uh, give us a stress uh, proportional to the applied voltage square over uh, the separation over the dielectric thickness square. And also this capacitor will uh, consume current uh, that's given by dq by dt. And this uh, that charge can be calculated as a regular parallel plate capacitor charge, except that we should note in, in our models, we will have um, the separation or the dielectric thickness will be uh, a function of time. It will change with time. And this, uh, this will actually uh, contribute uh, to the sensing. Uh, for the mechanical model, uh, again, it's uh, the well-known model of the uh, free bar here. And we notice that uh, the, the solution we, we have to, to assume since due to the boundary conditions, the free boundary conditions, and the, the, the anchored uh, center of the bar, we assume harmonic solutions in the form of uh, some uh, displacement amplitude that's function of time and uh, sinusoidal uh, displacement in, in X. We, we, uh, we cannot have uh, cosine, for example, or any, or any other chips. We are uh, restricted by boundary conditions to this. And so when writing the equations, we find that we can separate it for each harmonic by itself, can be separated to a single time domain differential equation like that. And the driving force for all the harmonics uh, will, be, will be given by this integral, uh, which we can solve here. The only thing to note is the damping factor B that we have, we can relate very easily uh, uh, to the FQ product of the resonator, the frequency time quality factor product, which, uh, uh, and doing so is, is very important because uh, uh, the FQ product can be uh, constant, can remain constant for low frequencies, and as we go higher, it can uh, uh, start increasing linearly with the frequency. So by, by having uh, the B factor depends on uh, the FQ product and not the frequency or uh, uh, the, the quality factor uh, by itself or stand alone, this simplifies a lot the model. So we don't have to, to know a priori the, the resonant uh, frequency. It will automatically uh, get accounted for by this formulation. And finally, uh, the thermal uh, model is just uh, a thermal equivalent circuit that's found in, uh, uh, in, in many transistor models. We have thermal resistance, thermal capacitor, and we dump uh, 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 thermal current or heat flow in, inside these uh, components. Um, so here uh, we can see the Verilog A implementation. We implemented these modules uh, into Verilog A, and for the drive here, we can see our nodes. We have positive and negative uh, electrical terminals of the capacitor. We have a kinematic node X that represents the mechanical node and our thermal node, along with the model parameters. Uh, here are the, the details of the Verilog A model. We can see uh, at each part uh, uh, some uh, parameter calculation and then uh, uh, the calculation of the actual force to be applied, applying the force to the mechanical node. And here is the, the input current uh, to be used where we calculate the capacitance. Uh, and our gap is actually variable in time. It's, it's not a gap. It's just uh, the thickness of the dielectric. It's a function of time. Uh, and finally, we also have uh, thermal uh, contribution to the thermal node. So all of this is just the capacitive drive module. It connects to all the model parts by uh, adding force to the mechanical module, uh, dumping power into the thermal node, and uh, drawing uh, current uh, for its own self. 
the resonant body or the, the mechanical module itself just have two terminals, the mechanical node and the thermal node. And we will notice here that we start introducing all the temperature coefficients for dimensions and material properties. So they will vary dynamically during the simulation as the device starts to heat up, uh, these dimensions and material properties will change and we can notice uh, or we, we will be able to see all interesting effects as frequent shifts or stuff like that. Uh, the, the main equations of the resonant body, again, are very simple. It just uh, adds uh, the corresponding force as uh, calculated from the previous slide. And finally, the thermal module only connects to uh, the uh, thermal node and, again, dumps uh, power that corresponds or represents uh, the thermal resistance and uh, thermal capacitance. This is uh, very, very well known uh, and can be seen in lots of transistor models. Uh, so you may have noticed I didn't mention at all the sensing module and why is that? Because it's just a, a capacitive sensing which turns out to be the same as uh, the uh, capacitive driving. And in our modular approach all what we need to do is basically uh, connect another module here we connect one module for driving and then uh, another module, which is the same as the driving, but we use it for sensing. We will bias it with constant voltage. And we connect here our mechanical module and here is our thermal module. And these are our two nodes, the mechanical node and uh, the thermal uh, node. Uh, we, we simulated this model with the uh, appropriate bias condition and we, we have gotten uh, a resonance frequency of 1.55 gigahertz and the quality factor of around 1500 uh, as we have set it up initially in, in the model parameters. But we notice uh, something is missing here, which are the harmonics. Where are the other harmonics of, uh, of this resonant bar? And since we didn't implement them in this first iteration, uh, we need to see how, how they have to be done. So as seen from the analysis, each harmonic is basically uh, corresponds to once again solving uh, another uh, differential equation in time, which means adding an extra node to, the, to, to our model and accounting for the total displacement at each uh, dielectric edge by summing the displacement from all these nodes corresponding to all the different harmonics. So here we can see uh, the modified uh, capacitive drive module where uh, the mechanical node is now a bus. You can, uh, we, cho we have chosen to account for 21 modes just for demonstration. You can, you can account for as many as you want or as small as you want. And also our edges um, uh, of the capacitor are uh, also uh, uh, variables here, and we, we have set them as nodes as well uh, to account for summation. H here we can see where we, we actually uh, do the summation. Uh, I found we, we have to do it through uh, other nodes, so Spectre can work with it correctly. So each, uh, each mechanical node has an associated uh, uh, helping node or auxiliary node that will sum its displacement together with the displacement from the previous, uh, the previous nodes. And so when we proceed forward and simulate this, uh, uh, this model now, we can see all the harmonics that uh, shows up and we have adjusted the parameters slightly so we get uh, a different uh, queue of uh, uh, 1600 and also all these harmonics have the same Q and this is this happened because we assume the FQ product varies linearly above uh, uh, above certain frequency in silicon above one gigahertz in 100 silicon so we we can see that uh, or we ended up getting all the harmonics have the same Q and we didn't have to artificially set the damping for each uh, harmonic it's just taken into account by uh, the fact of just modeling the dependence of uh, FQ product. And you can see here very well um, uh, why 
in the work demonstrated by uh, Professor Weinstein earlier, she has chosen the third and ninth harmonic because according to the position of the electrodes or of the, of the uh, capacitive transducers, uh, these are the harmonics that provide the highest signal. Uh, to proceed forward, so our goal is basically to, to implement uh, the resonant body transistor to model uh, uh, this um, uh, modulation of the mobility in, of a transistor. Uh, and also, we, we can see here two, uh, two types of RBTs that we are working on. We have seen the very first demonstration of the release RBTs that's, again, a very simple bar resonator and uh, a transistor incorporated in it. And we have seen the unreleased uh, transistors, uh, the unreleased RBTs that we do in CMOS. So for the unreleased RBTs, uh, the, the model we are concerned with to be, for simplicity is the one that has just the acoustic Bragg reflector on each side. So it's a kind of a 1D cavity sort of thing more or less, and in fact, it turns out that these acoustic Bragg reflectors uh, can be accounted for as a free boundary condition or an ap approximated as a free boundary condition. And we can see this by looking here at the acoustic impedance of these uh, um, acoustic Bragg reflectors, which represents the stress over the velocity. So at the design frequency, these acoustic Bragg reflectors will have a very small uh, impedance, as we can see here. Their impedance drop all the way almost to zero, whereas silicon uh, has very high impedance here. It's almost three orders of magnitude. So we can approximate them uh, kind of uh, free boundary condition, but uh, in a more accurate modeling, they should be accounted for as uh, a mass loading and a stiffness loading that will uh, change the frequency a little bit. So uh, in these uh, topologies or in, in all the unreleased uh, CMOS transistors, uh, CMOS RBT we are concerned with, we always have our uh, FET horizontal in the cavity. So the stress uh, that we need to, to account for needs to be averaged over the length of this transistor. And the stress we get uh, from the resonator modifies the mobility in this relation through a piezo-resistive term, and we end up having uh, a time variable mobility. Uh, the problem with that is most transistor models consider the mobility as uh, a parameter model. It's not, uh, it's not a variable. But in our case, the mobility becomes another unknown that we have to solve for during solution of the model. However, uh, the good news is that the mobility only changes but by small amounts. It's not a gigantic change to significantly disturb the operation uh, of the FET. So for this modeling, we have selected the BSIM models. And why we have done that? Because uh, it's basically an industri industry uh, standard. Uh, most foundries have model cards already available for BSIM models. We have the bulk model, we have the uh, BSIM SOI model, uh, so we, we can model a wide range of devices. Unfortunately, it's very complex. It's about 4,000 lines of code, and it has lots, lots of parameters. Uh, so how do we modify the BSIM model to fit into our model? We basically, I will demonstrate here for simplicity, the bulk BSIM model, but we have also done the same approach for the BSIM SOI, and we have used the IBM search to SOI model cards with them. So for the bulk model, we have to uh, add, uh, again, another uh, kin kin uh, kinetic node here, or mechanical node, and the thermal node, because the bulk model didn't have one already. The BSIM SOI have a thermal node, so we don't need to worry about that. Uh, and again, the, this uh, mechanical node is now a bus, so it can account for multiple harmonics. And also for the thermal node, we, we went ahead and modified all the location in the BSIM model where uh, it tries to access its uh, in, internal uh, uh, thermal node, internal self-heating thermal node, and modify these places to basically refer to our uh, model thermal node instead. Uh, 
Uh, and as we can see here, we removed all the sections that only depend on the internal node and accounted for hours. And the mechanical code remains the same uh, as uh, the, uh, the resonant uh, module before. And here is the complete model with the uh, BSIM SOI, uh, sorry, with the uh, BSIM uh, modeling our uh, FET sensing here. We can see this funny symbol. It now has, uh, it's a transistor that has an extra uh, mechanical node and an extra thermal node that hooks up into the other components. And these are simulation results from uh, such model. We can still see the harmonics uh, going very well. So uh, in terms of future work uh, and how to proceed, uh, in terms of design, we actually have uh, a tape out uh, by the end of, of July, uh, another tape out in IBM 32 SOI, where we will demonstrate hopefully new designs that will show uh, improved performance. Uh, we also have to, uh, in terms of the modeling effort, we have to make lots of addition, for example, to account for the uh, Brownian noise to perform time domain characterizations. Our model are all dynamic, uh, dynamics. They, uh, they can run in time domain very well, so we need to characterize them and uh, look for all kinds of nonlinearities and interesting effects. We also need to implement a more accurate model for the unreleased uh, RBTs. Uh, uh, resonator. Uh, by, by the end of this August, we're, we were releasing public domain uh, this RBT model that we have uh, seen today, and proceeding forward with the project, we will have to uh, implement a calibration flow, and we are also thinking about using Professor Dimitri virtual source model instead of the BSIM, because it's much more simple uh, uh, in terms of equations and unknowns. Um, also, uh, we, we are thinking about developing models for uh, the next generation RBTs, which uh, might be implemented in uh, FinFET technology. We, we, will, we are looking forward to, to that and to see uh, how much benefit we can get from it. And uh, our uh, ultimate goal will be to migrate all this model to the mod, uh, to the mod spec simulator uh, developed at UC Berkeley. Uh, and by this, I conclude my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bichai. We will conclude the uh, uh, e-workshop this afternoon, and I want to thank again Bichai, Luca, and Dana for the uh, presentation. So until next time, bye-bye, everybody.